Okay, well, I can see that the audience is filling up and uh, is it, it is exactly six o'clock here. So I'd like to begin if that's okay. Sure. Uh, welcome everybody to this Osaka University lecture series. I'm going to turn my email off, excuse me. Good. I'm Brendan Barrett and I'm the organizer and moderator of this session. And I'm a professor at the Osaka University Center for the study of co-design. Our topic today, um, as I'm sure you all know, is the net zero carbon energy transition in the context of the sustainable development goals, particularly SDG 7. And uh, really the question for the panelists is what can, we, what can we achieve in the next decade? For those of you who don't know, the SDG 7 is about access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all. And there are three sub targets. There's one around universal access to affordable energy by 2030. Um, the next one is about increasing the share of renewable energy. And it's interesting that the target uses substantially increasing. I think that's open to interpretation, what is substantial. And then the third target is to double the global rate of energy efficiency. So that's a really big, big challenge. Um, today, our panel panelists are going to really look at it from the perspective of Europe and Japan. So we're not so much focusing on say, what's the, uh, how would developing economies respond there, but maybe that's uh, something to, to reflect upon. And at the same time, we need to think about how we're gonna meet this global target of reducing emissions by around 50% by 2030. So we have a very busy decade ahead of us. Um, so we're, we're really fortunate to have three world-class experts uh, with us today in the panel. And um, before I ask them to introduce themselves, I just want to outline how we're going to tackle the session. So firstly, um, each panelist will talk for 20 minutes and then that will be followed by a Q&A. And for the participants, I really encourage you to use the Q&A box to, to post your questions question. and we will try to get round to answer all of those. Um, if there are any, any of you here with who are using Chinese characters, at, could you please uh, write out your name in, uh, in the alphabet, please? Just so that we can check on your participation and, and attendance. So thank you very much for doing that. Now I'd like to, as you know, um, the University of Groningen is a global knowledge partner of Osaka University, and we're very, very fortunate to have two faculty members here with us today representing the university. And I'd like to begin by asking actually distinguished Professor Andre Ha to uh, briefly introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your work and, and where you're located, because I know you're at more than one institution. Sure, thank you, Dr. Barrett, uh, much appreciated and great pleasure to, to address this uh, very international audience as I understood it. So uh, that's great because we're looking at global challenges as, as was already well introduced. And um, I will talk about the, the energy transition in, in Europe, where, where it stands and what it could, could look like uh, in the coming three decades that we, we have left to do that. Um, and I uh, work on that indeed from the University of Groningen, uh, now part-time and also as uh, director of science of uh, what's called TNO Energy Transition. That's kind of the national laboratory of the Netherlands on, uh, on energy. So more applied, working a lot with industry. And I focus them more on the, um, <clears throat> on the knowledge basis, especially on system analysis, modeling, et cetera. And uh, recently I also got re-affiliated with my, my old alma mater, uh, Utrecht University in the middle uh, of the Netherlands. And that's also in the field of energy system analysis. And uh, that will be, uh, key focus of my talk. So let me go to the uh, presentation. Oh, would it be okay if we just introduce the other panelists before? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Sorry. I, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. No, no. Just, uh, <laughs> a little oh. bit. They won't get a chance to talk for 20 minutes. Sorry for that. <laughs> yeah, you're here for 40 minutes. So maybe Evren, would it be okay for you to just bring Yeah, up? sure. Sure. Okay. So my name is uh, Evren, Evren Mursawas, and uh, I work at the University of Groningen. And I'm an associate professor in energy and logistics in uh, the faculty of economics and business. And today I will talk about, uh, about the energy transition, mainly focusing on hydrogen. Thanks. 
Thank you very much. And next, uh, Yohei, please. Thanks. Uh, my name is Yohei Yamaguchi. I'm an associate professor of, of Graduate School of Engineering, Osaka University. I'm usually working on the building engineering. Uh, so I'm developing a simulation model of energy demand of buildings, including people's activity, uh, time use, and appliance use, then the building energy demand is quantified. That, that's my work. But today I'd like to uh, briefly introduce uh, how carbon neutral goal is interpreted in the Japanese uh, energy policy. That's my talk. Thank you. It's going to be fascinating to be able to compare a little bit of what's happening in Europe and what's happening in Japan. So Andre, we're now in your hands. Thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, then uh, now it's really my my time to present. Uh, let's see. Um, can you confirm that um, things are on screen? Seeing your slide, yes. Very good. Okay, so we've done the introduction, and uh, also just to to mention what is kind of covered by my organization, but also introducing what we are looking at for this overall energy transition. It's it's of course lots of technologies and renewables and energy efficiency but also partly a completely uh, new energy infrastructure. And it has to do with land use when it is about renewables and, and spatial claims and use of other resources, sometimes uh, synergetic with uh, solving other environmental problems, but sometimes also causing new environmental problems. And so there is a lot of technology in engineering, but it is really a system change and everything is on the move these days. Renewable energy is no longer small, fortunately, so there's good progress. Uh, but that means that uh, that increased availability of renewable power uh, needs to be accommodated and affects markets. And uh, we need more flexibility in the system. And that uh, is affecting what, for example, industries may decide to do in uh, the next 10 years or even 20 years to change their processes. So that is now really at the core of the puzzle. How do we roll and roll it out? Or how do we implement that in an optimal way? And, uh, and not also getting into dead ends, for example, which is possible. And the investments that we are looking at, all the hardware that you see symbolized by these pictures, the investments are absolutely out of order. Like it is, it is thousands of trillions that we are looking at over the coming three decades that need to be invested worldwide. And um, major mistakes are really not preferred. So we need, really need good knowledge to, um, to, to plan that and make the right decisions. So the context for everything, and that I think uh, the whole audience is very well aware of it, is that we are now in a very, very squeezed situation to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement, as they're often called, at trying, it, it really would like to formulate that way, trying to limit global mean temperature change this century to one and a half degree. And I think we have already guaranteed that we will do 1.3 degrees today. So the remaining carbon budget or greenhouse gas budget that we have left to stay within that limit is really very, very small. And that means, and what you see here on the slide are the uh, scenarios uh, compiled by the IPCC a few years ago in the one and a half degree report that illustrated what needs to be done to, um, to stay within that limit. And um, the different pathways here are all the same in the sense that it is an, an absolute dramatic change compared on the, to the pathway where we are now globally. We still look at increasing greenhouse gas emissions on a global scale today. And there should be really an abrupt um, uh, change to that with uh, reaching about zero uh, around 2060 on a global scale. And for uh, the Western countries, uh, the Western countries, should, the, the, the industrialized countries like Japan, Europe, US, that would mean uh, zero by, by 2050. So it's less than three decades left to do that. And IPCC has pointed out on the left-hand side that if we are able to also include changing living standards, for example, on a large scale, so less flying, uh, changing diets, for example, to less meat consumption, uh, more circular uh, production consumption, eh? so, so maybe prolonging lifetime of all kind of capital goods, that would help a lot um, and would bring the decline uh, faster on top of deploying all these technologies. 
but it is also seen as something that is very hard to uh, to achieve. I like it a lot that the IPCC highlighted the importance of, of that because it's often forgotten. But unfortunately, I must say, we are more looking at the right-hand side of the graphic where we still see uh, a continuation of uh, growth of emissions on the short term and thus causing an overshoot of greenhouse gas emissions in that carbon budget. And the way to tackle that, and then things are becoming uh, quite desperate, is to introduce concepts that can deliver negative emissions uh, already in the first half of the century, but also in the second half of the century to compensate for that overshoot. And one of the options, you can see it in, in the text, so the slides are available uh, later on. Uh, one of the ways to achieve that is the combination of sustainable biomass, which is a complex thing in itself, and carbon capture and storage that would allow you to have a net removal of CO2 from the atmosphere. There are other ways to do it, direct CO2 capture from air and use, uh, for example, mineralization. But these concepts would be necessary in that overshoot situation, and we are in that scenario. So it is really, it is really uh, uh, a difficult situation and a very urgent situation. Now, to understand that system change, well, that this is kind of a, uh, maybe a bit of an unpleasant slide, uh, but to, uh, to, to understand uh, these type of system changes and whole, how all these options fit together over time and what would it cost and where would you do what, uh, we use models. And um, here you have some main components of uh, models, and, and I will give some examples and results for uh, the European Union, that is the, the scale level that this talk is uh, focused about. And um, it builds on a, on a key bottom-up engineering model. That's a very well-known group of, uh, of models that was first developed by the Joint Research Center of the European Commission, but taken quite a couple of steps further by, um, by academic uh, research. The, the name mentioned below, if, you, if you're really interested in this, is Blanco, Heere Blanco. I can really recommend his papers because he did a cum laude PhD degree in Groningen. That was really off the scale in terms of quality. So um, for the ones who really like it, uh, please check the papers. But the model is uh, rich in technological detail. It has uh, all the, the current performance, uh, projections of future performance, uh, descriptions of what would energy infrastructure cost, balancing mechanisms, uh, et cetera. And it can optimize. So it would look for solutions to realize the emission targets at the lowest possible cost, given all kinds of assumptions on uh, will you uh, are you willing to deploy nuclear energy, for example, or, or not? And you can play with these uh, conditions. So that's a well-known group of models. But the technical detail is important. And what we paid a lot of attention to in the work is the, um, uh, the role of large-scale deployment of intermittent power, so wind and solar, which is one of the uh, champions, of course, today of the energy transition. And that intermittent power uh, needs to be accommodated. The, um, the peaks and the lows uh, need to be balanced by, by flexibility. And uh, current thinking is very much looking at, OK, can we combine that with electrolysis that then needs to be flexible capacity, produce hydrogen, power to X. You can go to synthetic methane or chemicals, uh, liquids, etc. But also, uh, all these options uh, are, in a way, in competition with other mitigation options. So for example, uh, biomass, if we, if we think we have sustainable biomass, that can uh, deliver with CCS negative emissions and, and uh, brings an important factor to the, uh, to the whole equation. But also the whole demand side, of course, needs to be modeled. So that's done. And then to show what can you get into, there's all kind of um, um, uh, technical factors, of course, but that's not the point. But I have taken a few extreme outcomes of the modeling and we played it like a like a classic equalizer with some of the uh, uh, the key parameters for example co2 storage ccs is that deployed or not and it is still a much debated option in the european setting so uh, there is definitely a notion among many policymakers industries we need it to meet the targets but if you look at the societal support and the uh, position of many influential NGOs, they say this is a dead end, we should not do that, it just prolongs the lifetime of fossil fuels, so don't invest in it. And it is still very, very minor, it exists, there are some large-scale schemes and there is more investment, but it's uncertain to what extent this option will deliver. Well, the amount of uh, variable renewable energy, that's the VRE, 0% uh, is of course, uh, that is pure theoretical, but will it go to 100% of power, which is what uh, some people are really pleading for, or will it be kind of in the 60% uh, 
realm that has a big influence. Well, there are technical parameters, how fast are learning curves of, um, of electrolyzers and all that. So that's not the point now. And the, at the bottom is a very important one. And that is the role of biomass. It is an important option in Europe today. So um, about 15% of European uh, energy use is uh, is covered by biomass. So it is all kind of residues. It's even energy crops today, the classic biofuels, uh, biogas, uh, waste, et cetera. And um, part of the discussion is about, uh, we are uh, seriously constrained by that. So growth of sustainable biomass is very unlikely. It will always conflict with forest management and food production. But on the other hand, there is uh, schools of thought that say we can do a better job in using land, agriculture, uh, forest management, and we can mobilize much more of these sustainable resources, even complemented maybe by aquatic biomass like uh, like seaweed, which is a new kit on the block. So also uncertain. So you have a few fundamental uncertainties here still today for that energy transition on European scale. Now here's a graphic, a Schenke diagram as it's called, that links the simulated uh, future energy supply to meet the target. Yeah? So that's always the objective of the run. You want to meet the target, zero emissions about in 2050. Uh, you run the model with the given um, uh, assumptions and the key assumptions here, no CCS allowed and biomass is conservative. So it stays at the current level. And then you can see, uh, does the model solve and what kind of system does it, uh, does it project? And what you see here, logically almost, is that wind and solar are really dominating the energy supply. So these are really fast figures, uh, taking together over half of the, of the primary energy supply of the, of the European Union in 2050. Uh, biomass is there at the bottom, but it's basically current level. It will be used in a different way, for example, to chemicals and uh, advanced biofuels instead of power and heat, which is now most important. There is a shares of nuclear and hydro, which are not so different from today. So the, the real change is the huge amount of wind and solar. And that is partly accommodated by a lot of electrification. So directly to transport. So it means massive changes in the fleet and, and uh, large scale deployment of electric vehicles. Uh, second thing is direct electrification of uh, industrial processes. So that also means that the industrial capacity uh, needs to, to, uh, to change fundamentally. So you're looking at, in many sectors, very different uh, factories than uh, what we see today. And also in the built environment, for example, supplying heat by heat pumps. So those electrification routes are then very important. And on top of that, there is a very large capacity of power to hydrogen and power to X, uh, partly to provide uh, fuels for uh, heavy transport, um, aviation and, uh, and, uh, and shipping and partly also to, uh, to chemical industry. And this is also combined with, uh, with storage. And it solves, so it can do the job. The potentials are also there, so that's also good news. Uh, but what is important is that the spaghetti in between uh, the production and the demand is energy infrastructure and a system that's very, very different than what we have today, including the demand side. So the electrification and all that means that all these demand sectors uh, will look very, very different and based on very different technologies than what we have today. So this also comes at a cost and also requires an amount of change that is very impressive. Now, the alternative graphic is one where we said the CCS is allowed and Europe has good potentials for this, especially the North Sea region. And, uh, and also the biomass option is, uh, is pushed forward. And what happens in the optimization runs then, which is again done here, um, is that biomass is preferred because it is overall more competitive than the overall system change that we see in the, um, in the power and, and power to X uh, combinations. And that's partly explained by the spaghetti in between here, because what you see here is that biomass goes directly as fuels and feedstock to industry and, uh, and transport. And that's very similar as it is today. And another key feature is that the CCS is in particular combined with these new biorefineries. And these processes can easily be equipped with CO2 capture very cheaply because that is in some cases pure CO2 produced. And that means the mitigation costs of these uh, schemes are overall also very low. That is a key explanation why the optimization model likes to choose it if your objective is lowest cost. And there is one other effect that you see coming in because of the negative emissions and that, uh, that may come as a bit counterintuitive. There is some budget left to emit CO2 or greenhouse gases in other sectors. 
And you see that on the top of the graph where there is still natural gas used. And um, the total uh, solution is enough to meet the target, but part of the natural gas infrastructure, especially in a balancing role versus the smaller part of renewable, intermittent renewable energy, can then uh, still be maintained. And that means that the system looks more similar than the system than we have today. And uh, I'm not saying, uh, I'm not doing any, uh, uh, let's say, judgments on what is the better or the worse system. It's just that we have this space still to move in and that there is a couple of technical dimensions and also societal choices that have a major influence in what type of system we are looking at in 2050. So that is still a puzzle uh, to solve. Well, to say a few more words about uh, the biomass part, I said it's a major uncertainty in these models and um, there is strong societal debate in uh, various European countries on this. Some countries like in the UK and, and, and Germany, also the Netherlands, the perception is quite negative, while in Scandinavia, for example, in parts of Eastern Europe, the perception is quite positive. Uh, and also that is where biomass is a part of the, um, uh, of the mitigation strategy and sometimes some cases like in, in Sweden, Finland, uh, in the core. Uh, the key solution to realize those potentials is an interlinked strategy with modernizing and also making uh, agriculture more sustainable over time. So there is still room to, to uh, do farming in a better way, use less land per unit of food, especially in, in Eastern Europe. And that could also contribute to greenhouse gas reduction in itself. But it means that the implementation is not just a question of the energy system, it's a question of land use and agricultural policy. So that makes it also a very difficult beast to, uh, to introduce. And in the Brussels policy arena, this has been a conflict area already for one and a half decades. So um, I am not super optimistic that we will get the threefold increase of biomass in Europe in the time frame we're looking at. Um, looking at another important uh, part of, of the European energy system, that's wind offshore. So uh, a large part of the energy use of the, of the Union is concentrated around the North Sea. So Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, for example, uh, in the so-called ARA cluster, that's Rotterdam, Roer, Antwerp, uh, is a very concentrated pocket of heavy chemical industry. It's the largest chemical industry cluster in the world. So the, the energy use concentrated there is, is vast. It uh, will be sound familiar for Japan if you're looking at, uh, at the busy uh, coastal areas. So it looks a bit like that. And um, that means that uh, that concentrated energy use to, to supply that with renewable energy, um, that's a bit of a conflict. So one of the key uh, potential areas quite nearby is the North Sea, and that means especially wind offshore. So the developments there are very fast. The map that you see uh, depict plots for large wind arrays that are partly there and partly are coming there. So today we're looking at about uh, 20 gigawatt of capacity installed and operating. And a remarkable uh, result, I hope to say a few words on that, is that today the parks reach cost parity to the grid. So the, the new offers have reached about five euro cents per kilowatt hour levelized cost of electricity. And that is about similar to the levelized cost of electricity of fossil fuel use, so like gas and coal. Uh, there is still infrastructure to be built, but it means the market is now really pushing that. So big players are investing in large part. But for these future projections and the scenarios I talked about with a lot of uh, intermittent renewable power, we may be looking at about 300 gigawatts of wind offshore on the North Sea. So that's a 15 fold increase compared to what we see now. And that would require uh, for maybe those artificial islands of which you see an artist impression here. This is presented by one of the key TSOs in the area. And uh, they said, if we want to accommodate that, we may need to build an artificial archipelago in the, um, in the North Sea to have the transformer stations, also power to hydrogen uh, facilities to bring a part of this renewable power onshore via hydrogen, because all the cables will be too expensive. So this type of changes are needed. And that is not a small thing. I already talked about accommodating the, 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 the variable character. And this is, those are well-known graphics. These are typical patterns for a system that have higher shares of renewables. It's about 60% of intermittent renewable power. So not dominating. And the yellow peaks are solar. And on the left top side, you see a typical summer week in Europe then. And in the right bottom, you see a typical winter week in Europe. And then the solar is, of course, very small. There is a lot more wind. 
So you see the, the bluish colors are uh, the delivery of winds, more constant, but still going up and down. And with the 60%, you really need to accommodate um, uh, the shortages, which is, for example, the red areas that you see, that is um, reserve power that um, uh, will make little hours, but you need it for those really uh, difficult weeks. So there's a lot of demand and uh, less supply. Um, and on the other hand, you may have surpluses in the summer that you may need to accommodate by um, uh, adapting the operations of what are baseload power plants today, like uh, the nuclear ones. And this is still manageable, but what is more important is that flexibility becomes a very, very uh, valuable uh, commodity. So, for example, understanding how can industry respond to electricity prices with electrification? What can large fleets of electric vehicles do to accommodate this? So will people be willing to say, I want flexible charging, depending on prices and availability? can help or also hamper uh, the accommodation of the system. So this is something you really need to understand on at least Northwestern European scale because it is one big integrated system. And it can be done. The insights are that if you do it right with as many options as possible, basically, the electricity prices can be kept under control and quite on the same level as today. But if you do not do it right, so that is limited international coordination and markets do not work well and there are disturbances, uh, you may see very unpleasant effects like very expensive periods in power and overall a more expensive system. So this also requires international cooperation and coordination, especially in the big backbone infrastructure. Then hydrogen, uh, what is the good news is that if we have these large amounts of renewable power and maybe moving to three cents per kilowatt hour, two and a half cents per kilowatt hour is deemed feasible with the progressing learning curves of uh, wind and solar. And we are also pushing the electrolyzers, the scale and also the performance. And that is, there's a lot of investment in that area. And we have them running for really thousands of hours per year. This is a very difficult one because where is this power now going in the merit order? That is a puzzle to solve. Then we could look at hydrogen costs maybe around 2040 that are competitive with the hydrogen costs that you see from natural gas, uh, uh, natural gas conversion uh, today. So that's possible, but also it, uh, the, what I say is also a number of really key preconditions to achieve that. And it is especially uh, the amount of renewable power at that cost available for hydrogen that is very important for the business case. So this is still something that needs to be understood better. Where are the short term no regret investments to get that market going? And are we not pushing things too fast? Like there is now a lot of attention. Let's uh, look at hydrogen for vehicles. But yeah, the competition with um, uh, electric vehicles and the competition maybe with uh, sustainable fuels is also there. And we may in the long run maybe prefer not to have too much hydrogen in transport. So those choices are still important to make with a very good underpinning in the coming years. So that's the importance of system analysis. And the system integration goes further. So the little map you see at the bottom here is a very old one. It comes from uh, the Desert Tech initiative that was already started years ago with the thinking, there's a lot of renewable power, especially solar in the Sahara areas in the Middle East. And uh, we should over time connect it to a super grid that is intercontinental. And um, that at the time was seen as science fiction, too expensive. Uh, the, the transport cost would be prohibitive, but we have in the meantime, also, uh, DC cables that can do a much better job. Uh, we see these um, spheres with large-scale solar capacity and the blue, um, uh, the blue symbols with large-scale wind capacity actually popping up on the map. And uh, at the moment, developments in the Middle East and Egypt, uh, Morocco also are moving in that direction, that uh, export of power, but also of hydrogen could become uh, a factor in the equation, especially when we're looking after 2030, 2035. So this is also a very interesting element for um, uh, international collaboration. Can we find a consortia? Can we also secure the investments to, uh, to do that and find the business models to, um, to, to develop this? So that's a very interesting factor. Well, what is a complex one, I will just browse over this is the uh, transition of industry, which is a big part of energy use. And this picture uh, symbolizes uh, how different the energy use in industry is. It is refineries, chemicals, base metals, cement, etc. And the processes differ a lot. 
you need a lot of high temperature heat for the current uh, factories. That is feedstock use. Um, there is uh, a lot of power already um, used in many of these processes. So to change that to something that emits zero emissions and the scale we're looking at is really a massive uh, challenge. And you can look at a whole menu, a really complex menu of, of course, improving energy efficiency. And you can keep doing that in existing processes to quite an extent, but it will become more expensive. And then there is, in most cases, also new processes possible, other steel factories uh, from classic petrochemical uh, complexes to biorefineries that can produce biochemicals. Uh, cement may partly be based also on reused concrete. So there are recycling schemes that are uh, available that still use a part of the, um, of the calcium oxide. So the more circular options are there, uh, renewable feedstock, and of course, the use of renewable carriers, I already mentioned electrification and also uh, industrial processes that run on green hydrogen are very popular today in discussions in heavy industry. But of course, these options rely on what energy system can you operate in? Will the cables with green power, will the pipelines with green hydrogen be available at the moment you are retrofitting or rebuilding your factory? So it is a really an intermixed um, change of individual industries and clusters on the one hand, and the energy system on the other. And the coordination between the two is really important. Also because industry will be very influential in itself in steering energy demand. And for example, offering flexibility and maybe even lowering energy demand when more circular production kicks in. Because that's another sustainable development goal. We have to lean less and less on primary raw materials. So that's another strategic objective that is intertwined in that entire transition. And the understanding of this integration is at the moment I would really qualify as poor. So for us, it is a key topic for research also to integrate this in the scenarios, the models, and ultimately also in the business cases of individual factories. And imagining that that infrastructure that I talked about, just three decades left to do the job, while at the same time, the capital investment in these factories and the lifetime allow you maybe to make one of these fundamental decisions only in that period. And you can only have one of these big retrofits because otherwise you're looking at, um, at a capital destruction that will make the transition almost unaffordable. So the planning, the insights are already very important uh, today. So the, the electrification options I've talked about, some of them are available today, power to heat. Other ones may become really striking on the long term, for example, CO2 chemistry, which is also a popular topic in academia. There is a lot of things possible, but before the processes are commercial, we have time to go. So how fast will we bring them to the market? Is there still a key question? And I said the circular options. So these are the, some figures of plastics in uh, on European scale. And a lot of the plastics still end up in, um, in uh, waste incineration and partly even landfills, which is embarrassing. Uh, but there are options on the table with improved mechanical recycling that has to do also with product design and behavior, but also chemical recycling. So the back to monomer that can change that whole picture and have a major influence on the amount of virgin plastics that we like to produce from virgin feedstock over time. So that may kick in into the industrial infrastructure heavily as well. But to close the cycles, we'll also change the logistics, change the trade flows, etc. So there is a lot of things to consider there. And then this is, um, and, and part of it is in Dutch, I'm afraid. I, I apologize for that. But this is a symbolizing that kind of very difficult planning of the, the innovation cycles and the changes of the system over time, where you, on short term, have a tendency to stick to what we have. Let's improve that. That's what you see industry doing, for example. But at some moment in the middle, there is this explosive moment that decisions need to be taken. We are going for a different course. And that moment is like on the short term for some players and will be delayed by others. What is now happening with lawsuits against governments that they are had this happen to the Dutch government and also others. The government is really responsible for meeting those Paris Agreement targets. It is a, it is a major responsibility. It has now also happened to Shell, for example, one of the key oil majors. So the judge recently has said in a lawsuit that Shell is responsible for meeting the targets. And yeah, so is that then the explosion uh, in the middle or will they be in the defensive and say, well, we sell our oil, oil, oil assets and it moves to <laughs> companies who just keep producing or will it accelerate the change? So we have really in terms of implementation, 
and how to do this right, major questions. Learning curves, I've talked about it. So we see spectacular developments on the, on the bottom in the right is more recent data on PV cost reductions. And we are looking at a future that we may move to electric power from PV panels of one cent per kilowatt hour in the solar belt in the world. So that is spectacular, but we need much more of these uh, learning curves. Batteries are doing well, but I mentioned many processes like the biodefining, CCS, CCUS, that uh, are still uh, at the start. Oh, this is the solar curve again, yeah? that's the duplication. And what is important is that uh, what we learned in the past from doing this crucial, uh, realize this crucial phenomenon, cost reduction of these technologies, this is essential for keeping the cost of the transition under control. We've seen it in wind, for example, where many things were combined over time. Of course, it was in better designs, better materials, uh, the technology part, but it was just as much in economies of scale, both in the turbines and in the production. So the whole industry buildup of that and the competition uh, between them, the professionalization was just as important. And more recently, what I mentioned in the North Sea, reaching prosperity, also had to do with um, the cost of capital, that uh, the investments were seen as less and less risky because they're more competitive, and this made the financing of these parks far less risky and thus also cheaper. So that learning process is also something of an entire innovation system that needs to be managed. And we need to be really good at that. It is R&D, it is natural science and engineering, but it is just as much organization, market stimulation at the right ways. And this is something we need to understand very, very well now to make sure that it also happens fast enough because it is a key part of that transition. Now, some key things happening in the European uh, arena, and part of it is really good news, and I will close with that, is what is key action key of, and of essential importance is CO2 pricing. And fortunately, the, the European Commission has installed now, uh, has already introduced policies that uh, the CO2 price is rising uh, pretty fast, and it is now expected to stay. So the management of the um, uh, uh, emission ceiling, so to say, is, is crucial and is now really kicking into the, into the market. So I think today we're looking at about 50 euros per ton of CO2, uh, 100 euros per ton of CO2 is expected. And it is combined, and that's really important, with a proposal to introduce a CO2 import tax. So at the moment, products would come in from, sorry to say, from China, which are produced with coal-based power there would be a CO2 penalty connected to an important product and the CO2 price would be paid. And this is very important for the level playing field until we have global CO2 pricing. So this is very, very important. On top of that is the Green Deal uh, agreement, which is massive and comes with a lot of uh, funding, also for the COVID uh, recovery uh, schemes. And this is on a level that we have not seen before, just as in the US, uh, I think it is close to six or 700 billion uh, euros that could be mobilized for different uh, sustainability goals, but very much also targeting circular economy and energy transition. But this is going to secure a big part of market growth, and that can in turn uh, push that learning curve further in the coming 10 years. So this is very important. Pushing innovation, research, development, uh, demonstration and deployment, uh, that is the learning curve thing, is so-so. Uh, I think the R&D efforts in Europe are reasonable, but not strong enough. And I think we also need global collaboration here because many of these efforts are a global business and not something of individual countries. International collaboration, I cannot say it enough. It is there for the innovation part, also for planning the infrastructure. It is a global energy system, biomass trade, hydrogen trade. It is a matter of uh, global uh, efforts. And of course, it is a system transition and still difficult for policymakers that the three decades left, uh, it is not just focusing on CO2. It is also circular economy. It is more sustainable food and good land use. It is also about looking at behavioral aspects and also the acceptance of people of these changes. So all these things need to be managed at the same time and not one after the other because it will be too slow. And there's cross-sectoral policies, I think, are maybe one of the major challenges we're looking at on the short term to get better at, because this is still a barrier to, uh, to meet the time frame. Um, this was my last slide, so I, I have not looked at the clock, uh, Chair, Mr. Chairman, so maybe I abused you, but uh, I hope it's not too bad. No, thank you, Andre. That was a really fascinating presentation, and also you really set the scene 
uh, very effectively leading into Evrim's presentation where we, we, you know, we've got the big scenarios now and we can focus down on a very specific project, which is heaven. Um, but I have to confess, I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very familiar with the situation in the in the US and I've seen some very detailed scenarios coming out of there, such as Princeton University put one out quite recently. This is the first time for me to see such a comprehensive set of scenarios and analysis from Europe. So I really do appreciate uh, your presentation and you, you raised a lot of issues and you really showed the need for a systematic uh, approach to this, I think. That, uh, that message came over very strongly there. So thank you. I can see a couple of questions are popping up for you as well in the mm -hmm. Q&A. Um, but now maybe we could go to Evrim if you would like to um, boot up your presentation. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. yeah, just need to, okay. Yeah, is that fine? Yes, perfect. Is it okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, um, well, um, as Brandon said, I think Andre made a very nice introduction with all the possible scenarios and all the future possible solutions. And in this presentation, I'm going to focus on a bit more on one of the solutions that we see and that being the hydrogen. Um, as a researcher, um, I work on the supply chain network design and uh, value chain optimization problems surrounding this path uh, towards the zero emissions. And uh, because this transition to a low carbon society requires new research, new business models and economic models. And this is what we do with our team here especially focusing on what Andrea mentioned a couple of times on the uncertainty. So how can we make these decisions under uncertainty? How can we provide robust solutions? And the methods that we use with our team basically comes from operations research. So mathematical modeling, uh, providing optimal solutions and uh, algorithms, heuristics and techniques. Um, uh, currently, I am the scientific leader of uh, two European uh, projects. One is on uh, carbon capture, usage and uh, storage, and uh, one is on uh, hydrogen. And uh, today uh, I'm going to be talking about HEAVEN, which is on hydrogen. HEAVEN stands for the Hydrogen Energy Applications uh, Environments in, for the Northern Netherlands. So here in the Northern Netherlands, uh, we want to build a hydrogen economy where the hydrogen can be used for the industry, mobility, and the built environment. And with the Heaven project, uh, this is what we want to achieve. Heaven will act as a catalyst and pave the way for the Northern Netherlands economy to go beyond what we have, beyond the present uh, fossil-based approach that we have. This is a six years uh, project with about 90 uh, million euros of uh, funding and uh, the expected greenhouse gas uh, abatement potential we foresee is about uh, 60,000 tons CO2 per year. And we also uh, foresee the production of um, 1500 tons per year of green hydrogen. Um, we believe that the Northern Netherlands uh, can offer the opportunities and possibilities to be a hydrogen hub. The sustainably generated energy can be converted into green hydrogen uh, right here in this, the first hydrogen valley of the Europe. We can generate the renewable energy via wind farms or uh, solar energy. We can produce green hydrogen via electrolysis we can store it for later use. We can convert it back to electricity when we, are, uh, when we have less supply of wind and solar, or we can distribute it, we can transport it via pipelines or trailers to the end users. And those end users being for the industry, transportation and the built environment. Uh, we have a lot of uh, 
why this region? Because uh, we believe the Northern Netherlands has the potential for it. The region is perfectly positioned uh, for this. First, we have the large scale existing and also planned, as Andrea mentioned, the supply of renewable energy electricity. This includes the, both the onshore and offshore wind and also solar. Moreover, we have strong interconnections with the larger wind-based areas in Denmark and Germany. We already have a large-scale chemical industry. They're already experienced in the production and handling of hydrogen. And we also have the existing gas transmission network and large-scale underground storage infrastructure. There is already an ongoing decarbonization of mobility in the urban areas. There is knowledge and expertise and also a strong political support uh, from three different uh, provinces. And the uh, Heaven program is built upon the Green Hydrogen Economy Roadmap that was published in 2017. So based on the Heaven, on this investment agenda, uh, Heaven program was um, deployed and it covers the whole uh, value chain from the sourcing to the production and conversion, logistics aspects, distribution of the hydrogen, use in uh, and the transportation of it, the use in mobility, industry, and in energy application. We cover the infrastructure from the spectrum being small to large, innovative aspects, of course, knowledge and education, societal aspects, policy development, and the financing part. The consortium is about um, uh, consists of about 31 entities uh, from seven European countries, and the partners range from large companies to um, SMEs. We have associations, knowledge institutions, and experts, and regional development institutions. And we also have a very broad uh, national and international su uh, support, international support that uh, we had about uh, 60 parties providing us the letter of support, of which Japan is one of them. And we also rely on uh, broad politi political support uh, covering the whole political spectrum. Now you see the consortium parties uh, who are involved in this uh, project. We have um, well, also newly added parties like Shell as of this year. So we are quite a big um, uh, partners. Brandon, would you like to switch to the um, movie? Because we also prepared a video, maybe that might help to uh, understand the Heaven project. Okay, I can do that. Would you like to stop sharing? Okay. Okay, let me cancel this. Let's go to share screen. And I think here we go. Let me start that. As we proceed towards a climate neutral 2050, we are reaching the point where we put theory into practice, especially when it comes to hydrogen. So far, European efforts concerning hydrogen have been individual initiatives for the most part. The time has come for an integrated approach to gather our best ideas and put them to work in an actual region. The European Union has identified the Northern Netherlands as Hydrogen Valley. That's not surprising. In one ride, you'll find everything you need for a green hydrogen-based economy, sustainable energy sources, generation, storage, transport, as well as applications in industry and applications in mobility and our day-to-day -day environment. This time, the project partners are not researchers. They are makers. They will make the hydrogen economy flow. To achieve this, the project comprises of four clusters and will be realized by the end of 2025. With the region's green power converted to hydrogen, we will be working on storage and infrastructure, making hydrogen a raw material for our industry turning hydrogen into heat and power for residential areas. And it will give us mobility, green mobility. This sectoral integration is rarely seen. We are doing it right in this valley. 
We are progressing on some 30 sub-projects we have prepared over the past two years, hand in hand with public and private parties. We are working hard to set an example for Europe to follow. Hydrogen Valley. Go back to you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'll go back to my presentation. Okay. Very nice video. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I think uh, it uh, shows clearly what's happening. Right. Okay. So now that we had an um, overview, let's also see like uh, what is involved. In, within the project, right? What the project will uh, facilitate. Uh, from the industry uh, zone, the project will facilitate the supply of uh, green hydrogen to green methanol production process by uh, Bio and CN. We will be facilitating the supply of green hydrogen to produce uh, bio kerosene for uh, air transportation and as a renewable drop in e fuel for transport application. In the heat and power sector, uh, the project will facilitate uh, heat for residential um, use. Uh, so we have um, 100 and also 250 houses in Hohefein, and also the, our municipality building in Groningen will be uh, heated by uh, hydrogen. We have the use for uh, industrial heat in, at Amtec in uh, Emmen, and also hydrogen can be used as a, a mobile power supply. And this we will do for the, as a backup power for the data center in uh, Groningen, in Weitznet. And also uh, the same uh, power supply will be used as an onshore auxiliary power uh, for inland boats and barges in Delsile. In the mobility uh, sector, we will be covering the whole range of uh, traffic from the passenger trains to the heavy duty trucks. We have uh, queue liners and crafters, um, buses uh, in 20 buses in Groningen. And of course, we will need uh, refueling stations to fuel them. And this is also included within the project scope. We also cover the maritime sector. We will have one hydrogen uh, inland uh, salt barge. Uh, for the maritime transportation. For the storage and infrastructure, we are going to have the deployment of underground gas storage system at high stock in Veindam. Currently now the, the pilot tests are being held. Uh, of course, the studies uh, for the deployment of uh, repurposed and new hydrogen pipelines. Within the project, we will have two pipeline installations one uh, being the polymer-based pipeline connection in Delsile Chemical Park, and the other one is the deployment of new hydrogen pipeline between the GZI, GZI site and the Amtec Industry Park in Emmen. And of course, next to those pipelines, which is uh, for now yeah, within the project periods, we also have the distribution of the hydrogen across the region via trailers. Um, in this uh, scheme, you see the, well, the overall uh, scheme of the HEAVEN program. The green parts here show the, uh, the backbone, the green energy invested from the North Sea. Then you see the four different clusters mentioned in the video. The first cluster, you see the cluster in Delsail. The second cluster is the, for the storage and the built environment. The third cluster being Emmen with the electrolyzer at the Antec site. And the fourth cluster with all the mobility applications and the fueling stations. Of course, you also see the pipelines that we uh, mentioned towards uh, Amtec and at Delsal. And we have the trailers that are distributing the hydrogen across the whole region. And uh, if you look at it from a broader perspective, we foresee the backbone by gas uni uh, that will be built and, and the rollout to mass application will be later realized. And uh, we are proud that this will start from our region here, uh, Hydrogen Valley right here in the Northern Netherlands. 
Okay, so this was about the, the more about um, the deployment uh, applications within Heaven, and I would like to also talk a little bit about what we are doing in the academia from the research perspective. The, um, the one important feature of this Heaven program is that it serves as, it sets an example. We're creating an example here, and it serves the purpose uh, as being a blueprint for replication across Europe and beyond. So this is actually why we need collaboration from international parties. And um, therefore, um, I will introduce some of the studies that we are conducting within the heaven. And uh, they mainly use methods from the operations research. And uh, maybe you might be re relate uh, to them. And yeah, I'm open for uh, questions or collaboration ideas. Okay, so we covered the whole uh, value chain and here I try to uh, group them uh, based on the, each node of the whole value chain. We focus on the supply of renewable energy and in that we study uh, the, the, for example, the how to better optimize the wind farm operations and maintenance operations. In another study, we look at how can we uh, well include the solar plants into the already congested grids. What are the possible options? How can we uh, yeah? How can we do this more efficiently? At the power networks side, we look at the challenges associated with the higher penetration of renewable energy into the grid, with the increased uncertainty. We study the, uh, the optimal power uh, flow problems with renewable energy sources and the hydrogen storage poss possibilities. For the production uh, side, for the hydrogen production side, we try to tackle the challenges associated with uh, what Andrea also mentioned, the production cost, the need to investigate the energy efficiency of the electrolyzers, its operating and capital costs, as well as the relative prices of gas and electricity. In one current study, we are trying to analyze, okay, how can we increase the economical uh, effect of uh, this um, integrated wind power, uh, wind power production and hydrogen study by uh, looking at the possibilities of selling the hydrogen to the hydrogen market, for example. And we're also looking, for example, for optimal policies for uh, strategic capacity planning for electrolysis plants in the multi-period setting. Okay, what would be, as these can be built modular, what would be the setting in 2030, 2040, or 2050, developing the roadmap to 2000 towards 2050. At the infrastructure uh, site, we are looking at the optimization problems for the uh, transmission pipeline uh, networks, dealing with the multi-source uh, pipe network layout problems about, and also including the retrofitting options, when to retrofit them, in which areas is it more economically feasible, what is technically uh, possible, and also by the use of polymer-based pipeline connections uh, for new uh, pipeline developments. At the mobility side, currently we are covering the heavyweight road transportation, maritime transport sector, and also the railway uh, transportation. In those problems, uncertainty is very important. So we need to make our decisions under the uncertainty of supply and demand. So, uh, well, one study that we're working on is the solving the stochastic multiple flow re refueling location models. Um, as this here, I covered all the nodes in the value chain, but what is really important is actually how you can connect all these sectors together. Um, in that one, uh, one decision that's taken by another party might not be optimal for the other one because each party has their own timelines, objectives, and budgets. So we are looking at ways to how to connect them, uh, how to connect them better, how to make those decisions uh, in order to uh, come up with a you know a, a, a system approach, a better optimized system approach. Well, this was a summary of what we do, and uh, this is my email. If you're interested, please just contact us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evelyn. That's a really interesting presentation, and um, 
if you want to stop sharing your slides, I actually have the impression that um, uh, you're ahead of Japan <laughs> on this one, but um, uh, maybe uh, Yohei can correct me. It's, um, it's really impressive just how far you've gone with that project. And uh, so I was searching before, um, before your talk, what was happening here in Japan. And I just discovered that uh, Toyota has announced a project in Fukushima prefecture that will uh, start very soon. And it seems very similar to, your, to heaven, to be honest. So it's interesting to see that they're going in that direction. And maybe there's a lot of scope for you to collaborate with uh, Fukushima government and Toyota. They have a quite extensive lineup of partners, including some of the major convenience stores, which is interesting and uh, other uh, mobility companies and so on. So this is going to be a project for, I think a town of around 300,000, uh, a population of around 300,000 that will be supplied, but it's just been announced in June. So it'll be interesting okay. how that goes. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks for that really interesting presentation. And, and Yohei, now is your opportunity to tell us a little bit about what's happening in Japan. Okay, uh, my role uh, today is to introduce uh, what is going on in Japan, uh, especially on uh, energy transition. I'd like to, uh, Andre also talked about the IPCC's scenarios. Um, so there are many options uh, what we, uh, we can take in, in coming decades to achieve the carbon neutrality, um, but it is, uh, uh, very uncertain. We can reduce uh, energy demand. Uh, also, we can uh, invest uh, advanced technologies. Uh, but uh, in, in the context of Japan, it is not easy. Uh, I'd like to start with this uh, figure. This figure shows the um, primary energy supply in Japan uh, from 1960s. Uh, so Japan emit 1.2 gigaton CO2 in the year of 2013. This is a reference year of, of the uh, commitment in the Paris Agreement in, of Japan. Um, so the self-sufficiency rate of climate in the primary energy is only 10%. So Japan heavily rely on import of the fossil fuels uh, from abroad. Um, I would like to show this uh, figure. This is a cumulative carbon dioxide emission uh, of the regions and countries. Japan is here. Uh, Japan is responsible for 4% of the historical emission of carbon emission. So Japan has uh, responsibility for the uh, climate change. Um, the responsibility is not small. So we have to uh, take a role in overcoming the, um, the climate change issue. So the government has uh, initiating uh, this, uh, this challenge and uh, uh, this slide shows the uh, measures to uh, reduce the carbon emission, which is published in the document of, uh, published by the Ministry of Environment. Uh, so the uh, area of area shows the amount of carbon emission. So the carbon emission can be divided into two parts, electricity and heat or fuel. So what we can do is increase in energy efficiency. So the horizontally, we can reduce the emission. And so we, we, we can also do uh, decarbonization of the sources. So reduce the intensity of the uh, carbon carbon in electricity and fuel. So we can reduce uh, electric, uh, carbon dioxide emission. If the carbon intensity of electricity is smaller than those of the fuel, then we can switch the fuel. So in the engineering uh, perspective, uh, these three measures are available uh, to reduce carbon emission. By integrating these three, we can reduce uh, a large amount of uh, CO2. Um, um, before uh, taking 
the goal of carbon neutrality, this uh, figure it was very good uh, to understand the uh, relationship between the uh, emission reduction and technology implementation. However, now we need to consider the carbon neutrality. So this emission should be zero. So uh, it is very uh, challenging for the Japanese society. So this figure is um, published by the Ministry of Economy, Technology and, uh, and Industry of Japan. Um, so currently the Japan emits approximately one gigaton of CO2 annually. Electricity occupies 40%, transportation industry building sector also uh, occupies these uh, proportion. And the target of 2030 was uh, 26% relative to 2000, the year 2013, which was recently updated to 46%. To decide the uh, carbon emission target, the government uh, did uh, engineering analysis by using a bottom-up model. Uh, this is the equation they used. Um, this is a product of unit reduction that can be uh, achieved. Uh, that can be achieved by introducing uh, technology, and the, this is the number of units, uh, number of te technologies implemented in a Japanese society. So, by summing up the all technologies reduction, we can quantify uh, how much uh, carbon emission can be reduced in coming years. So, base the twenty six percent target was determined. Uh, based on this kind of analysis. However, 46% was not uh, supported by this kind of uh, analysis. Um, the government just decided uh, through the discussion with the international uh, societies. Um, now uh, the Japanese government is trying to uh, break down this, uh, this reduction target into specific technologies options how to realize this reduction target. And for the 2050, we announced that the carbon neutrality will be achieved. So the government is now still uh, working on uh, how to uh, realize such uh, carbon neutrality. So this figure is uh, published in this document uh, by METI. Uh, so we, we uh, we're going to develop carbon-free electricity using renewable energy, nuclear, uh, carbon capture and storage, and etc. Uh, we also uh, transform fuel uh, side uh, to hydrogen, methanation, um, biomass. That has been introduced in the previous two uh, speakers. Um, we also uh, focus on negative emission technologies uh, because some part, uh, we are expecting some parts uh, cannot be uh, transformed by these uh, technologies. So I'd like to uh, introduce what the government uh, is doing. Uh, th there are three big uh, work by the government. One is uh, set the target and vision. So this is one of the example, the reduction target, and they uh, also um, uh, create a vision of the future energy system how uh, carbon neutrality is achieved. They also break down the target and vision into the national energy plan, uh, specifically, which is called strategic energy plan, which is uh, updated in every three years. Um, now the government is trying to update this uh, document and a lot of uh, committees are working on this uh, plan. And also uh, uh, specific uh, policies are implemented uh, on related to energy supply and technology development. I would like to, um, but this, this kind of uh, policy challenge is not the first time for, for Japanese society. This figure shows the uh, composition of power generation sources from 1952. Uh, so um, the big part during 1970 was oil imported from uh, abroad, uh, the, the majority of uh, electricity was generated by all oil uh, during 1970s. But we experienced oil crisis in 1973 and 1979. 
And then we noticed that rely on single uh, fuel well is very risky. So the government decided to diversify our energy uh, sources. So uh, the government uh, invested, uh, put a lot of money on nuclear uh, renewable energy sources and the utilization of natural gas and development of the international cooperation to import LNG and other uh, resources. So th this is the consequence uh, in the 2000, before the, uh, so around the 2010, uh, we have uh, this diversified elect, uh, sources of uh, fuels uh, for power generation. Uh, here, there is a big change in around 2010. We experienced the nuclear power explosion at the Fukushima uh, Daiichi power plant and, and uh, all nuclear power stations were uh, shut down. And, Still, the uh, proportion of nuclear was uh, small, but in gradually increasing. But the government has already announced uh, uh, the uh, target of the power generation sources in 2030. Nuclear plays is expected to play a very important role in the power generation. Coal also, uh, LNG also, a uh, high proportion. So the proportion of the carbon-free uh, electricity is 44%. This is the government plan. And one of the initiative government took was the uh, dissemination of renewable energy sources. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this graph shows the approved capacity in so-called feed-in tariff program. In the feed-in tariff program, uh, it is mandatory uh, for power companies to buy renewable energy generation at fixed price uh, set by the government for fixed period. So, and the power company's cost of buying renewable is passed out uh, to customers. The revy is approximately three yen, which is a three cent uh, per kilowatt hour, which is equivalent to 10 to 20% of the electricity price in Japan. Um, but uh, this uh, po uh, program works very well uh, to disseminate uh, solar PV. In Japanese, uh, peak electricity generation, um, sorry, the peak demand in Japan is like 170 gigawatts, uh, but the uh, approved capacity is 70 gigawatts for PV. So the, uh, this capacity is very big, and um, uh, that's why we have the increasing capacity of uh, renewables in the power generation. However, unfortunately, the um, proportion of other uh, sources are still limited, like wind, which is very different from the European context. Uh, so in the generation side, we experienced big change, but also we observed a uh, big change in the building sector, for example. Um, so this graph shows the uh, proportion of lighting luminaries uh, in Japanese buildings. Uh, so the, currently the proportion of LED light emitting diode is very high, that almost all buildings, new buildings use LED instead of uh, incandescent and fluorescent lights. So, uh, which is uh, due to the technology development by industry and also the techno industry's voluntary phase out from fluorescent light, which was coordinated by Japan Lighting Manufacturers Association. So the, um, the Japanese industry plays very important role and they are willing to, uh, they are uh, relatively high acceptance to the voluntary action to uh, reduce carbon emission. Um, at the same time, building efficiency, building energy efficiency uh, policy was amended uh, to cope with this kind of change um, and a needs to reduce carbon emission. So building energy efficiency code was updated to, uh, to uh, accelerate this kind of energy efficiency change. So energy system in decarbonized society would be 
um, like this renewable energy generation is everywhere uh, on the rooftop and a window uh, probably and the flexibility uh, flexibility provided by heat pump and and EV will be play will play very important role to cope with uh, the fluctuating uh, the generation of the renewables and energy efficiency designs and practices should be standardized and also the energy system the systems or appliances equipment are operated in the optimum manner uh, using the information technologies and big data for example um, everything is automated controlled the loss is in minimized uh, yeah so uh, i expect very big change in the demand side and demand side reduction is very important uh, to give the flexibility to choose in the supply side. Uh, this is this slide. This figure is published in the ITCC report with the reduction of energy demand. Uh, the supply side can choose uh, options, uh, available options without reduction. All of the options should be implemented to realize the uh, significant amount of reduction. So I'd like to uh, talk a little about the supply side of energy. So this figure illustrates the complexity of energy supply system. Uh, so we have, we already have electricity supply system and the gas system, but uh, as uh, Evrin's presentation uh, introduced, hydrogen plays very important role. Uh, we import, uh, we are expecting uh, some part of uh, hydrogen come from overseas. And so the import is here and the CO2 uh, carbon recycling technologies, it will be, we play important role to uh, utilize hydrogen uh, also. So I would like to simplify this complex uh, system. Uh, so energy system can be divided into primary side and the secondary side so primary energy system uh primary energy is the natural uh, sources of energy uh, listed here and the uh, second energy is uh the energy we really use uh in the daily life so what we are doing uh, to promote uh, hydrogen is is that uh to to develop technologies to use hydrogen uh, directly and also uh, to develop uh, the infrastructure to transport hydro hydrogen and uh, the carbon free to to make uh, these uh, secondary energy to uh, uh, to carbon neutral that's uh, what we are doing so this slide shows the uh, roadmap uh, to utilize hydrogen uh, published by the, uh, the Japanese government. The key technologies are listed and the key numbers are listed, which are target of the technology development, uh, which is for 2025, 20, 2030. Uh, so these are use side and also these are supply side. Uh, you can find these the information on the website of the METI. So to simplify uh, this figure, uh, this is uh, the government is trying to do. So uh, uh, hydrogen is produced by renewable energy or carbon free sources of, of electricity. And also, um, so this hydrogen can be used directly by using a fuel cell and a hydrogen vehicle. Um, the second, uh, the government also developing the uh, infrastructure to use hydrogen um, through uh, methanization. Metha methanation. Methanation use uh, carbon, uh, CO two, uh, to integrate the. Uh, with the hydrogen to create methane. So methane can be used by use, can be transferred to the end users uh, through the existing gas pipelines. So this kind of change we are ex expecting. So 
creating uh, uh, hydrogen and the CO2 is produced through CCS or biomass, and, and then the methane is created and transported to the existing pipelines. Um, so this is uh, uh, what the government is trying to do. And the industry players uh, take a very active role to, to, do, to achieve it. So um, the previous speakers already uh, mentioned the difficulty to realize the change. Uh, I like to, uh, I learned the characteristics of such a big system, which, which has been developed over the last decades and the complex relationship exists. And people prefer improvement rather than big change uh, innovation. So uh, it is, uh, very important to realize uh, such a path to realize system level change. So I'd like to um, briefly show uh, this pathways. Uh, one pathway is, so there are two pathways from white to black. One is gradual shift from white to black, uh, but the other one is uh, the black part is created at the small scale, but the scale up to the black, completely black. So this is uh, one approach. So um, the government should explore this uh, pathways to transform the existing system. Okay. So um, this is the final slide. Uh, so we have history to develop our energy system over the past. So. The, there are many things we have done. So the viewpoint of uh, the uh, experts and uh, people are very limited because the, uh, we think things based on what we have done. But what we, what, what, what we need to do is to uh, uh, take a distance from what we have done and to build from scratch to, to make a big change in our energy system. So uh, this is the uh, final slide. Uh, we have very limited carbon budget. Um, we need to uh, develop uh, energy system, which is complete different, completely different from today's energy system. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Yohei. Um, we can now, can we spend a few minutes just responding to some of the questions that the students have raised? I, I don't know if you guys have to rush off. I hope you can spare just uh, 10 minutes or so. Okay, great, thank you. So I think, Andre, the first questions point, there's a few questions at the top there pointing towards you. And one is around, I guess, the developing country perspective when you're really heavily reliant <laughs> on coal. Um, you know, what kind of scenarios would really work in that context? The, the Shah Sada uh, talks about um, clean coal. I guess that's really carbon capture and sequestration working there. But um, you know the, the scenarios you describe work very well in the European context, perhaps also in the Japanese context. But what about somewhere like Pakistan? Yeah, yeah. No, I saw I saw the question. So great, great input. First of all, yeah, the the one on the coal plants that are are being realized right now. I think that is one of the really major concerns we have on the global map. Uh, we have also been able to hear just the, the, the latest warnings from the International Energy Agency in terms of if we want to stay on the emission path, we like to realize basically every new investment in new energy generation capacity should be renewable based and maybe uh, some fossil with, uh, with CCS. So building new coal-fired power stations without um, uh, capture today is basically working against uh, anything we want to want to achieve so that that is really a major concern and to have um, the alternatives really on the table in countries where electricity demand is growing very very fast and and which is of course a top priority to uh, to meet it um, to have this, those alternatives available now i would say should be a key concern of governments but also of key companies building that uh, what is Part of the good news here, if we talk about those alternatives, is that the electrification based on renewables uh, proves in many places to be even faster than uh, based on classic 
central grid and, and coal-fired power station layouts. It's, this is observed in India, for example, where the rural electrification is done faster with uh, renewable-based systems, and they're also cheaper because of the learning curve that we have discussed. This has a very big impact on these smaller scale systems, is much better uh, for the local regional economies. We are looking at that also for, for Sub-Saharan Africa at the moment, where uh, this is now almost certainly going to be a faster and more economically attractive alternatives for local communities to get electricity. So that's one. Uh, I would say uh, a second or third best is still, uh, if, if really things are urgent with capacity increase, to look more at natural gas than at, uh, at coal, uh, because that can also be used more flexibly uh, later on. Uh, but that is uh, this is a, a real worry. We 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 that that bend in the in the investments is is urgent. Is really urgent. And any assets we now realize uh, based on coal or uh, or oil refining capacity for that moment, <coughs> they're not only uh, collide straight into the targets we want to realize, but they can also become stranded assets if countries uh, decide to adopt uh, carbon taxes, like uh, in ten years from now those investments are going to be hit badly. The Netherlands has examples of this where new coal-fired power stations are just in operation for five, six years, are now shortlisted to be closed down in, in, in just five, six years from now. So that's full-blown capital destruction. And uh, so that's really a thing you want to avoid in the energy transition. And I, I agree very much with Dr. Yamaguchi's final point that we should look at these things with an overview, uh, also with, with kind of a backcasting and forecasting combination that we really avoid these uh, these uh, unfavorable decisions. Great. There's two questions I'd like to combine. One is from Claudia, who's talking about the storage issue, and uh, how significant is it? What how, how uh, important a part does it play in the scenarios? And then Jorge is asking about the spatial implications of some of these. Yeah. You talked about yeah. the, bio, the biomass, but uh, I think it's the infrastructure as well. Right. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, uh, I saw the whole bunch of questions, so I'll, I'll give a bit more aggregated answer, maybe tackling some other points as well. I think uh, also looking at the different presentations, uh, also of Dr. Uh, Usafas and Dr. Yamaguchi, um, uh, we are talking about a system change and these, these scenarios that we're looking at and what could be optimal usually turn out most optimal, so also lowest cost, and also in terms of can we meet the target on time, when we have all options in the race. That is really a, a consistent outcome of these system analysis and models. And that means we should not exclude anything. Discussions on we do not accept CCS, we do not want nuclear, sensitive file, but to discard it would on global scale also not be clever. Uh, many people uh, have a perception biofuels are bad, but we can do it. So discard that option and we will not meet the target with the negative emissions. So that's one we and also the efficiency, etc. What you see if you have all options on the table and you can deploy them in elegant combinations, also depending where you are on the map, what are the potentials, where are the what is the energy infrastructure you have today and what can you have in 10 years from now, that generally leads to the cheaper solutions, and it can be easily understood. When you look at each individual option, whether it's solar or whether it's biomass or CCS, the more you want, the more extreme the footprint becomes in terms of space, in terms of investment, in terms of fitting it into the system. So all these supply curves go up the bigger you want. So you want as many supply curves as you have, as you can imagine, and keep them in the cheaper part. And the combination then usually results in a cheaper and also easier to implement system because you stay away from the extremes. And that's very much true for infrastructure and space as well. If you would lean only on biomass, clearly we have a footprint that we cannot accommodate. But a quarter of global energy use on biomass is a different story, with residues, marginal lands, etc. Uh, with solar and wind, it's a bit the same. We can principle, make a principal choice. We go for 100% solar and wind, but that was also in one of my uh, first slides, you get a system that is completely different from what you need today. And it is really a question if we will be on time to make that complete overhaul of the energy system. We may want to use uh, the existing infrastructure, like the retrofitted gas pipelines that, um, that uh, Dr. Usafas mentioned. That's one of these clever uses of existing 
equipment and existing capital. So those type of elegant solutions are very important to keep the, um, uh, the investments and also the footprints under, under control. So this is coming in. And that's also true for storage. <laughs> Yeah, and that is also true for balancing the grid in the right way. So I, that's kind of an aggregated answer tackling different questions I saw. Yeah, thank you very much. That's great. Uh, everyone, there's a couple of questions around your project. There's one around, you know, what to what extent can hydrogen replace the current fossil fuel energy? And, uh, you know, for instance, is it possible to uh, fly planes on, on hydrogen? That was from Cheng He Hyun. And then later, lower down, there was another question about um, would this project work, would your project work in uh, an area that, that's not, not next to the coast? Yeah. Okay, okay, let me give a general answer. So we think that if it's specific to the Heaven project, we do not cover the air transportation. So we do cover the, the heavy, heavy truck the, um, the, and the maritime transportation. But uh, we do have uh, several pilot uh, runs for uh, railway transportation in, uh, in the Netherlands that currently have happened. And another project, we are tackling the use of hydrogen with the airports. And uh, in that, uh, we, are, uh, we are working on uh, solutions, for example, with uh, Airbus uh, for the use of hydrogen in aviation. And uh, if you would like to check, there's a, a concept E0 for that. So maybe you want, might want to check that uh, project. Uh, but within Heaven, we are not focusing on uh, the uh, airline applications. And uh, I think there was one question, can it be used hydrogen or what is its advantage over other ones? Um, so if you compare it, for example, with uh, the, the use by, by the electrified version, then you have uh, slow, uh, faster recharging times and uh, longer ranges. So that's one advantage. And also there is the possibility of that you can store hydrogen for longer uh, use. So that's uh, what we don't have with the other options. So that's an opportunity. Um, can we use it in areas where it's uh, off the sea? Well, if every, I think, uh, region should look at its own, uh, what, what, what is being offered, its ups and downs. So here, okay, the wind energy for us is a big uh, source, but maybe in countries where the solar power is more dominant, then uh, they would be focusing on the renewable energy generation from solar power. So it could be, you just need to look at, okay, what do you offer as a region? What are your assets? What are your strong points? And develop your own uh, scenarios accordingly. Just like of the many scenarios that Andrea mentioned, I think there are many variables, many parameters, and these models should be run based on each specific region. Great, thank you very much. Um, Johe, there's a question for you here. Um, it kind of ties into what Andrea was saying around keeping all options on the table. But the question was, uh, why does nuclear power continue to be a major energy source in Japan despite the Fukushima accident? Yeah. This usually comes up about the Japanese energy policy and whether it really changed post Fukushima or not, or how it changed. Yeah. Uh, I think there are two main reasons. One is uh, we already have a big capacity of nuclear and there is um, and also we have industry to support them, support the nuclear technologies. And so um, many industry partners want to keep it. And that's uh, the one uh, main reason. The second one is there are not good alternative of nuclear. That these are two main reasons. There's another question on waste as well. Um, I guess there's uh, a question. It, it kind of ties into the cost effectiveness of, of nuclear in terms of whether we're able to effectively uh, deal with the waste. Um, I know that Finland has definitely responded to this quite well, but in Japan, there's still some question mark about how waste is handled and uh, it, whether that costs are fully taken into consideration there. That was from Claudia. Yeah, so the government is uh, taking a lot of studies on the cost of uh, how to deal with the nu nuclear waste. Um, but the experts all, um, so our energy price is relatively high compared to other 
European countries or, or, and other regions. So that's why nuclear is competitive, even though uh, take into account the uh, cost for the um, waste treatment. That was so far. And again, uh, we don't have a good alternative of the nuclear. That's why we keep it. So that's my understanding. How do you think, Brenda? No, I agree. Actually, I think this whole um, session has been really interesting to contrast the European and the Japanese approach. And, you know, even though there's been some comments from the, um, the attendees about differences in terms of eco-friendliness and so on and so forth. But I also think, you know, if you just from from both, both the presentations from Andre and Evrim, I get the I, firstly I see the very much the project based response, but I also feel that the scope for international collaboration amongst European countries is is amazing, and I think that uh, it's more challenging in Japan because of the fact that it's difficult to create an um, Asia wide grid uh, as a solution there. So I think that. That although some some have argued in favor of that, but there there are other reasons, geopolitical reasons, that really prevent um, uh, cooperation go taking place on that scale. And I, therefore, I think it's quite an interesting, um, as in this session, to contrast this, these two two regions. You know, things like biomass. You'd think seventy five percent forested country like Japan could actually. Uh, use biomass, have a biomass energy policy, but then there are lots and lots of reasons why that doesn't happen as well. So yeah, it's just, I think it's been really, for me, it's been very uh, illuminating to contrast the two. And I, what I'd like to do actually is as we wrap up, because we're running out of time, I think we don't have the chance to uh, really respond to all the student, uh, all the attendee questions, but it's, it's to give you an opportunity, um, each one of you, just to make some final remarks, maybe some observations on, um, you know, what you have also uh, noticed during the presentation or just responding to the, to the students uh, or the attendees comments there before I bring this to a close. Perhaps Andre, would you like to, to begin? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, it, it, uh, I was indeed scrolling through the, the list of participants and the name. So it's really, uh, it seems to be a global attendance and, uh, that's great. I, I think uh, if there's one thing clear, especially for for people now in in the studies, whether it's PhD or or, or beyond, um, uh, there is a career guaranteed in this field. Let's say for the coming <laughs> three four decades, because it's it's so huge and there is so much to do. Whether it is solid engineering, natural science, up to the policy side and psychology in terms of. How can we implement this? How do we mobilize people and, and communities uh, everywhere efforts are needed? So uh, maybe that is my, my key message to the audience. I think you had a, a very nice expose indeed from, from different perspectives, different countries, different scales also uh, on what the energy transition uh, is, is about. And we were not exhaustive for sure. <laughs> um, that, um, that, is, uh, that is a huge amount of work to do. And it is, it's one of the great challenges of our time, but also one of the great opportunities. But, but maybe last thing that I've not emphasized so much, but that uh, going into the analysis, uh, seeing the technical possibilities, what is ahead of us. And when we do things right, when we, we, we plan and implement things cleverly, there is also a huge economic opportunity for this because the, the, the competitiveness of these future clean energy systems is likely to be better then sticking to business as usual with ever increasing prices of imported oil and, and gas, uh, let alone the external uh, cost, but just from a macroeconomic perspective, it's the right way to go. And then other, looking at other countries like Denmark, for example, small country in Europe, but a giant in this, in this game, they have a, an absolute decoupling of economic growth and they have solid economic growth. It's a very rich country. And, uh, and their CO2 emissions and their GDP is boosted by the clean tech sectors that they are managing in a fantastic way. So it just shows that there is a huge opportunity in moving the right direction. Absolutely. And I like that you brought in the economic angle there. It's something that we should have highlighted in this whole lecture series that yes, we've got these huge challenges, but um, on the opposite side, there are economic opportunities and uh, 
career <laughs> career development opportunities as well. Um, Evren? Yes, so um, indeed, uh, I think uh, all of you students that I also scrolled down, right, uh, have good career prospects. And I would like to underline the urgency of this issue. So we have, um, I think, the biggest challenge that we have now uh, with this energy transition, there might be the technical as the technical uh, challenges. Yes, there are, there are also the economical challenges, but I think the biggest issue is the time. So I believe we don't have time. So we need to act fast. So we rely on you all. So work. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm so impressed that we, we've, we have 93 um, attendees who have followed us all the way through. And uh, we were up at 106 at one point. So we've had really great commitment. And I'd really like to thank all the attendees for participating. Yohei, you have uh, the final word. <laughs> uh, I have a similar message to students. Um, so I had the opportunity to design a course on climate change uh, for the virtual course students. And, and I learned that the concept of carbon budget and the carbon budget is uh, the question is how to divide the, the limited carbon budget so the country nations and the generations so the stake of the younger generations is very big so um, I would like to collaborate with the younger generations um, yeah their, their role is big Thanks for that. I also hope that we can have more collaboration between Osaka University and Groningen. Maybe this is one of uh, the start of something and I certainly think we can do more around energy and also uh, climate change and how we respond. And I think there's so much potential for knowledge uh, sharing and potential research and development and, and joint projects. So I really hope that this is the, the beginning of something and I really look forward to the opportunity to see you face to face, not just virtually. Maybe that will be possible one day um, if we can keep our carbon footprint small and we can avoid the uh, COVID. But uh, I'd like to end by thanking our three uh, presenters for absolutely fantastic presentations. It's been really interesting and engaging and I really appreciate that you have uh, put you know, you know, you're very busy people and you have devoted your time to make this uh, event a success. So thank you very much. And I'm sure the audience will be giving you a, a virtual round of applause. So thank you. And uh, with that, I'd like to bring the session to a close. So thank you so much. Thank Take you. care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Stay safe. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah.